meeting. Do we have a proposer and seconder? Okay, so William Goldie, Councillor Goldie is proposer. We've got a seconder. Is that Billy? I'm not seeing who that was. I think it was Billy. Oh, Billy. Suzanne, mm -hmm. I just think he's on to mute. Okay, all right, thank you. Smashing, that's great. Um, Matt is arising. We've got a CCTV update from Matt. I'm so keen yourself, Chair, just because it's one of the ones that was picked up on. It's just to give you a wee update on the the work that's been ongoing in relation to Common Old House Park and Carbrain, I think it's, is it like Carbrain, gully. The, the gully. They've identified, there's one other site, but they've identified a couple of sites that are suitable for CCTV at the Common Old House Park and the, the gully. And I'm just getting some costings in for that at the moment, but we're hopeful we'll be able to proceed with that um, in the not too distant future um, to start to take the, 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 the process forward for delivering. On that, and the other site is, is getting looked at as well by our team at the CCTV as well. So we're, we're moving forward on those, just to give you an update on that. That's brilliant. That's really good, yeah. I think the three sites were the Gully, there was the Ravenswood Nature Reserve and yep. the Community Park. So that, the, the, the Nature really Reserve is another one they're, they're going to do a bit, a bit more assessment at, but the other two have identified uh, a design potential for that. So we'll hopefully be able to move forward on that. That's fantastic news. Thank you so much. That's really good. And I think, um, you know, I think we would all be happy to see those moving forward, given the levels of sort of problems we've had over the, the sort of past summer. Hopefully things are going to calm down a wee bit in terms of the, the, you know, the bad weather and, you know, the weather changing. And it may not be quite so bad, um, but it'd be good to pick that up for next year. So brilliant. Thank yeah, you. We'll just, we'll, we'll, see, we'll just, we'll fight, we need to finalise costs and look at budget, etc. But between, um, obviously we're now getting towards year one, year two, it's something we can look at to try and in, in, incorporate within um, the, the, the budgets going forward. So quite confident about that. Smashing. That's great. Um, do you want to make any comment? Oh, I've got Adam and I've got Councillor Goldie. Yeah, thanks, um, Matt. Uh, just to check on the, the locations you said there. So I joined a meeting just a few minutes late, but you said Cumber Old House Park. And the paper said Cumberall Community Park. Um, so is is a CCTV going to be installed in the house park as well? No, oh, sorry, it's, it's just my my mistake. It's, it's the Cumberall Community Park. Okay. Um. Well, that was actually going to be a request from me. Would be to ask if we could look at potential of CCTV in Cumberall House Park as well, because we have had a fair bit of antisocial behaviour there over the years, and I think it would be useful. Um, if we could look at the, the possibility of that. We'll certainly take a note of that, Adam. We'll include that in potential projects for the future, yeah. Great, Thanks. thank you. Councillor Goldie? It's just really to see, but are, is this the temporary cameras, Matt? Is it, are, and are we going to be dependent on the areas on having live electricity feeds? Because I know that's been an issue in some other places. No, this is looking at uh, fixed cameras, permanent cameras for these sites, Councillor Goldie, and uh, linking it in uh, properly to um, wire them up properly for that purpose. That's fashion, thank you. Um, anyone else? Suzanne, can I yep. come in here? Can I ask yep. um, Mark where about these cameras are going to be situated in the community park? I don't have the full I can hear you, Billy. I don't have the full details of the, the sites at the moment, but once I have those sites, I certainly will share them with the board. That'd be great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Well, that's, I think that's a really positive um, piece of work. So great. Thank you. Sorry, Suzanne. Um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Claire. Just on the chat, but it's just, uh, but I think Matt's just answered what my question is, but just to clarify, <clears throat> have you got a list of stuff? Um, with potential sites already, because uh, I know there was a, a couple of reports um, I'd put through uh, that came from elsewhere. And it's just to check, uh, do you said you'll bring it back to the board of the, the, the sites that you've got 
just so as it's not duplicating work if it's already on your list. Yeah. I was just referring to Billy's question about the, the park. He was asking mm -hmm. the locations in the park in particular. And I said, once we know where they'll be, we can, we're can we happy to share that. We, feel we usually yeah. we get the plan and they're just dotted on the map as to where, where they'll be. Once we have that, then we can we, we can share that. Right. So mine's as a separate question then is, do, have you got a list of like all the potential sites throughout um, the Cumberland area um, of where it is? I know it could be quite a sensitive thing as well. Is it better just double checking with yourself out with the meeting, whether you've yeah. got a, a note? Right, well yeah, done. I've got a chat with you outside after that. That's smashing. Thanks, Matt. Great stuff. Okay, are we okay to move on? Okay, so the next item is the Chair of Community Board Arrangements. Um, so it's just to remind everyone that this has been my last meeting as Chair and that as of um, close of the meeting, Alex will be taking over as the Chair um, for the next year. We had arranged that what we would do would be that the Chair would sit for a year and then the Vice Chair would take over and sit for the following year. So, with that in mind, are there any expressions of interest um, to become the vice chair for this year? What that would mean is that if Alex is not available, then um, they would be chairing the meeting. Anybody of any interest? What I do have to say is it doesn't have to be filled tonight. We can um, keep this on the agenda and move it forward. We don't actually have to fill a vice chair position at all. Um, or we can do it, you know, um, as as and when the need arises. Okay. I think okay. as the need arises. Okay, I? that's fine. Okay. Um, yeah. And yeah, if anybody does want to express an interest out with the meeting, then if they just drop a wee email to Community Matters email address, then we can take that forward. Um, so that's good. Okay, um, moving forward then, item number five in community matters. Now we had various bits of um, bits of requests that had come in through community groups, and I've just got a little note on some of them to update you on them. Um, these are items which um, were raised by the community, and um, there are, are various are different ways that are, we're going to be dealing with them. So um, there was a request that came in to have a discussion about recovery NL from Lisa, and I think that can be raised later on in the agenda because it's been covered at, the, at that point. Um, Lisa had also brought um, an item forward about flooding in the village, and I understand that, Lisa, you've been um, spoken to direct about that and that we're going to take that off table and arrange um, a site visit for that. Um, if you just let me know that that's OK. Um, information on emergency planning process. Um, that's been passed on to the appropriate person and we're waiting on information coming back on that. I think, Lisa, you've been made aware of that. And then finally, on planning applications, I think a number of people, including myself, had raised um, that and were looking for some information. So, first of all, um, I know that Gary circulated some um, paper briefings on planning. Um, earlier on to, um, uh, with the paper, so that was really helpful, and I think that that does address some of the issues. But I think you've got a further update, Gary. Is that correct? Yes, Chair. I'm happy to give an update at this time. So, based on the inquiries received, I have been in touch with the planning manager, and they have agreed to allow uh, an, a meeting off table for those that are interested to discuss the, the 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 planning situation now it wasn't so much about specific planning applications it was more so to do with um the impact on local infrastructure that the planning applications may have so the proposal that i would be looking to make tonight is that we perhaps get um, a small group of representatives from the community board to meet with lorna bowden and her team you know in the not so distant future to start the conversation and and to bring forward the points that you want to raise, would that be acceptable to everyone? I think that sounds like a a, a good idea. Um, anybody want to make any comment or indeed want to volunteer to be involved in that process? Um, 
Um, okay, right, I've got Adam, yep. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, um, Gary and, and Suzanne. Um, just in terms of, of planning, um, I still don't think we've we've really confirmed the role of the community board in the planning process. Um, previous um, iterations of, of this um, forum um, had a, a, a significant role, I think, in planning, um, going back to the days of the, the local, um, uh, local area partnership. And um, specific meetings could be convened when they were major planning applications. Um, so I think some clarification on the role of the community board in the planning process would be useful. And we have a number of major planning applications just now that I would expect to be discussed at this board, um, or perhaps to investigate the possibility of a specific meeting to discuss those planning applications. So for example, the, the 600 home development um, in the, the site of, of uh, Dollar Golf Club. Um, so, Matt, I don't know if you've got any more information on, on kind of the the specific role of this community board and what it might be in the future of, of planning applications submitted. Thanks. Um, certainly, Adam, in terms of the, the plan, you know, the, the pre-application that, that comes in that you're probably referring to, that did come to previous meetings of the local area partnerships, locality partnerships. What we do, if we receive any information relating to that, we will share that information with those people who are who or on our mailing list and encourage the, the, the developers who are having events to discuss those meetings, to do, ha, having, having events or meetings to discuss those particular planning applications, then they will, we'll, we'll, we'll share that, all that information with the board to allow them to be able to attend that and give further information and gather further information, give any feedback, and then feed that in to the planning process. It's not the intention that the planning applications themselves or those who are proposing to put a plan application forward attend a board meeting to actually do that that was something that, that wasn't considered um as, as the best use of the the community boards um time and agendas for that purpose but certainly encourage anybody who's interested in that make them fully aware of that information and encourage them to attend other events yeah yeah thanks matt i think just on that point i think it would be useful if uh, perhaps consideration could be given so that the community board perhaps has a similar weight to community councils in terms of representation for, for planning applications because obviously we're a, we represent a number of community organisations here as does uh, Coming on Community Forum. Um, and I think that it would be useful if um, for, for major planning applications we have coming forward, if the community board reaches a decision about you know support or object and if that is taken into account, by the, the planning officer or the planning committee going forward. Yeah, I think we'll take on board what you're saying. That's maybe something we'll to discuss with Lorna as part of the discussion, but the community board isn't a statutory consultee in relation to planning applications, and, the, and I understand there's no plans for it to be so. But we'll say that's certainly something we can discuss with Lorna. Thanks, Matt. Um, I've got Councillor Goldie. It's absolutely no issues with the community board being involved in discussing planning issues. Uh, but it's just to point out that as a councillor or that, I wouldn't be able to take part in mm -hmm. any of the meetings or whatever. And I assume my councillor colleagues would be the same because obviously yeah. if we express any opinions or show anything at all or that, we're disbarred from the process later on. So it's just really to make this point, fully support the community being involved in it. But uh, as a councillor, I wouldn't be able to take part. Yeah, thank you. That's that's quite helpful. I mean, I'm aware that it is a process that is very much based on sort of statutory elements, and that is something that we have to be very mindful of. And I think we just need to defer to the officers um, to keep us right, so that we're not straying into areas and territory that really um, is is out with our remit. Um, I've got Councillor Barclay. Hey, thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, I think um, Billy's uh, is kind of. He said the, what I was going to say, but it's really stressing to people who want us as councillors to come down on one side or the other. Now, don't get me wrong, we've got our personal opinion, and that might be that we think it's a really good idea or we think it's really awful. But as, as Willie has said, what that does, if we go public <clears throat> and take part in either a pro-demonstration or an anti-demonstration, we then have what people know which way we are going to be going and that means if it comes to full council and there's a vote, we can vote because we've already said 
which way we are going to go. Um, and we would need to come out of the, the actual decision decision making process. And I don't think people are quite aware of that. They, their expectation is that, that you'll be manning the barricades as well. And you may well be doing that in your head and in your heart, but physically you can't, you've got to keep your, your sort of your, um, your mouth shut basically, because you, if you do say something, it means that you might not be able to vote the mm. way the community want you to vote when it comes to the actual vote. So you, you've you've stood with them and said, yeah, I, I don't want this or I want this. But actually, when it comes to the vote, you don't have one. And that really, I think, where the community is concerned is where it counts, is because they, they want a voice at that. And if if you make a, 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 a declaration publicly, you don't have that voice. And it's just trying trying to get that balance as councillors, you know, to, you know, that... Um, where you're standing, but not to say so, is is a difficult one for everybody. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Councillor Goldie, very briefly, because I, I want very to briefly, it's just to say so. If you put forward a, something on planning or that, and you get an email back from us saying thank you very much for your email, <laughs> you'll know it because it's not that we're no interest. It's just that we can't really say anything more. That's smashing. Thank you for that. I think that sounds as if the meeting with the planning officer will be really helpful. So can I take volunteers or um, anyone want to show expressions of interest for attending? Yeah, I'd be quite willing for that, Suzanne. Great, Billy. Thank you. Um, so would I, I. That is Alex. Thank you. And um, myself as well. And yourself, Adam. And I think Lisa as well would be interested in doing that. So. Okay, yeah. that, that's that's really helpful. That would be really helpful. So maybe um somebody could report back to another the future meeting to bring us up to speed on what, what there is in regard to that. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move on to Common Cottage Trust and that's Adam. Um yeah, thanks. Um so Cumberall Cottage Trust, we had our, our AGM recently and uh, Colin had suggested it might be a good idea if I give a a brief update um, tonight to the community board. Um, so I am the, the chair of, of Cumberall Cottage Trust and we are an organisation set up specific organisation set up specifically with the, the aim of um, obtaining the former Cumberall Theatre as a community asset. Um, so Cumberall Theatre Trust has now moved to their, their fantastic new uh, building next to Cumberall Academy. Um, and there are some real concerns about the, the status of the, the former theatre building, the, the cottages and the auditorium. Um, the, the building's got a great history behind it and people are really concerned that uh, potentially we could lose the building and that's something that nobody wants to happen. So we set up as an organisation a number of years ago. We managed to secure some funding uh, mainly through Campsies Centre Cumberland Board um, and we've undertaken a feasibility study and uh, we're going through an architectural study just now. Um, so what that's looking to do is to identify the potential uses that the building could, could have going forward and whether or not it would be feasible to undertake a community asset transfer because the building is owned by North Lancashire Council. Um, so the, the stage we're at just now is that the, the building has been vacated um, unfortunately, it's not in a great condition. Um, it doesn't have a, a functioning boiler. Uh, there's been some water ingress, there's been some vandalism. Um, so the longer that the building is kept empty, um, the, the, the greater the chance is that we could uh, lose it. Um, but I know that we are working with the, the council's property team to make sure that they've got a, a, an eye on the building and are, are dealing with any incidents as they arise. So as an organisation, though, we can't really progress unless we have help and support. And that's the stage we're at now. So we've got a committee. Um, what we're looking to do is to expand that committee. Um, myself, I've been involved in, in various um, potential community asset transfers over the years. And each of those have fallen down at some point along the way. And um, looking at when we, we looked at the, the village school, uh, when we're looking to take that over as a community asset, one of the big stumbling blocks there is that 
while in our initial meetings we could pack out the village hall, when it came to actually people coming on board and helping us out and progress that, um, the numbers were thin in the ground and it just mm -hmm. wasn't feasible. So we really need people who are able to, to help us and, and give practical support going forward um, to, to come forward. Um, and what we'll be looking to do over the next couple of months is to finalise that archite architectural study um, that's underway just now and to identify how the potential uses might fit into the building. We're looking at possible funding streams going forward, working with other groups and organisations in the area as well. So it is feasible, um, but we do need help and support from the local community to be able to, to drive that project forward. If anybody's got any any questions or anything, they can contact me um, after the meeting, um, and and I'm sure Matt or, or or Alec will be able to pass on my my details. Thanks. Sebastian, thank you. Anybody get any questions? Anything that they would want to ask at the moment? Okay. 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 Maybe people will contact you afterwards. Then, um, hopefully, that will be. Be good. All right. So moving on to the next item, um, and it's general community board business and updates. And I'm going to pass on to Jared McLaughlin, who is our community champion and head of service. Thanks. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. So um, obviously, our role is uh, developing um, across the council, but there is this agenda item where try and give um, a few updates um, where possible. I think the first thing I should probably note is the Remembrance Sunday um, and a big thank you to all those who were involved in organising um, this event. For those that attended, I think you would agree it was certainly well well organised. Um, moving on, um, as far as COVID is concerned, um, I'll probably tie it in with just something that was mentioned by Adam earlier on about the coming old theatre, but um, we are seeing um, not so much in our secondary schools, um, but we're definitely seeing it in our primary schools now. Um, a slight rise um, in the numbers. Um, it's it's it, it's it varies across the whole council. Um, we have had it, um, certainly significant issues in some of our ASN establishments. Um, it's certainly uh, prevalent within our primary schools. Uh, just to give you an example today, so bear in mind this is where people who are positive and are having to self-isolate. So just today we've had five teachers and 68 um, children, so that's self-isolation for um, 10 full days. Multiply that with a pattern of those sort of numbers and you can see the sort of impact that we are seeing as um, in the case of teachers, but also um, our support staff and uh, facility support moving, moving forward. Um, we're also seeing a reduction in some of our early year settings because of the impact of COVID um, and uh, staffing levels. So that's where um, parents and carers who are entitled to 1140 hours will not be able to get that because of um, staffing uh, issues. So it's just to make you aware that it's certainly um, prevalent and that sort of ties in with the latest guidance that's come out from Scottish Government. Um, today, there's been other announcements about um, COVID passports, etc. But there is specific guidance that comes into schools and centres, um, and certainly there are some positives where we're starting to see other things happening, like dental nurses now being able to come out. Um, there's a Child Smile program that now can start back up. Um, however, um, they have strengthened the language in the guidance around parents not coming to settings because they see them as unique settings. And I know people find that very hard when they see big music events or football events and why it is that parents and carers um, can't uh, come into um, schools and centres. Um, in our schools at the moment, um, parents and nights um, events are online. But one of the biggest things that I'll soon start to get the emails about is uh, for across the whole council is why parents and carers can't attend um, various Christmas events um, carol singing, etc. So schools will look and centres will look for alternative um, approaches to ensuring live streaming of these or recordings, um, etc. But just to make you aware, certainly from um, the COVID perspective, you'll be aware of that with the numbers. Good news about um, certainly about the COVID passports um, not being enforced um, because there was great worries about that. However, 
um, certainly there is um, still an ongoing concern for us within education, um, which links in with um, uh, an inquiry I received from Cumbernauld um, Theatre uh, at, I think they're called Lantern House, I think it is, um, asking about if our children and young people were still going to be attending the pantomime. At the moment, we sent back the response to say yes, and that's subject to uh, any further changes or guidance. But at the moment, those children, young people will be, because there was a worry and concern, um, and I'm just talking about Cumbernauld Theatre because they specifically sent us um, an email. Yeah. However, that the, there will hopefully uh, those children, young people will be able to go and enjoy the new uh, Cumbernauld uh, Theatre. Uh, a big thank you uh, to all those um, who attended um, and engaged with the budget uh, update meeting that took place a couple of weeks ago. Just want to thank uh, people for that. And the last thing just to, to mention is maybe um, I know um, it was uh, Adam that mentioned there about the, um, the Cumbernauld Cottage Trust, but I'm looking to, and I'll find it hard to get around absolutely everybody, but moving forward, um, if you'd like me to come and speak to um, a group or just to come and listen to or to speak to a key person, um, I'm more than happy to start and do that because um, I'm Head of Education for the North. Um, I know about our school's um, estate uh, early years. However, I'm starting to learn more and more um, about the community and I think it'd be really important for me. Um, I go along to Education and Families uh, Committee. I know many of the councillors, but as far as uh, community groups are concerned, um, if I put my email uh, address in the chat bar, um, I'm more than happy to try and get round and meet various uh, community groups to see what are the, the main things um, that are on their agenda and maybe something um, that I'll be able to help with. What I'm not promising here is that I then become the person that can go and lobby on behalf of everybody because that would be almost impossible. However, there may be some things that I might be able to, to help or link people um, up with. So, I'm more than happy um, to do that, and I'll put my uh, email address in the chat bar. Thanks very much, Chair. David, that's really excellent. Thank you. I think it's really great that groups are going to ha be able to have that direct link with you, which is really important to have someone at a senior level within the council who understands about the challenges that are faced within our communities and and really has a sort of broad overview. So that's really helpful. The other thing I would say is in support of what you said about COVID, um, having had that myself a couple of weeks ago, very generously shared by my nephew, who's a primary school pupil in um, Northland. So um, that, that's, um, that's been a wee experience, but um, I do understand that there are, are significant challenges around that, particularly in relation to staffing. Um, has anybody got any comments? I've got Councillor Goldie. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, are, are, is it, are the school kids still doing a couple of lateral flow tests a week? Is that the, the current position? Yeah, um, yes, it is. Um, there's plenty of lateral flow tests. We've also got packs for parents and carers um, to do the PCR test that maybe not be able to get to a site. Um, but we are working still closely. Um, and I still meet like a team in the morning, half past eight. I meet with a tactical group and we go through all the various uh, schools. But um, yes, we still do that. And in some cases, public health are coming in and um, we have the support of their teams to actually give out the packs to both staff and pupils if there's a particular problem in a particular setting so that we can try and uh, reduce it as quickly as possible. But to answer your question, yes. Okay, anyone else? Any comment, questions? Nope. Okay, thanks very much, Sarah. That's question. Um, so we are moving on now to item seven, which is the act now, which was a presentation that Maddie Halliday had tried to um, do at the last um, uh, meeting and, and had terrible technical difficulties. Um, so we had the presentation circulated and hopefully everyone's had the chance to have a look at it. And we have Monroe Fraser here um, who is able to um, answer any questions or any points that anyone has to make on the subject. Okay. Have we still got them all? Yeah, I'm here, thanks, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, anybody get any questions or points that they would like to make on Monroe? Do you have any sort of brief update that you want to give us? Um, well, 
Not really any brief update. I mean, I think the presentation kind of summarises it quite well. But I mean, maybe if you didn't get a chance to to look at the presentation p before uh, tonight's meeting, we can uh, I can put my email in the chat bar, and you can give us a give us a buzz whenever you want. Um, but yeah, other than that, there's there's no real significant updates out out with the presentation. I mean, yeah. I can also put in the um, I think a good way to keep up to date with what Act Now is doing, you could um, you could subscribe to our bi-monthly um, e-bulletin, which I, I'll also put the link to that in the chat as well, because that's good. Um, uh, and also, actually, if you don't want to just read through the, the presentation, Maddie Halliday, the, the project lead, actually presented already to, to seven of the nine community boards. Um, and in our in our bulletin we've got we've got links to all seven of those so you can actually watch and timestamps as well so you can actually go and watch her present at all seven if you you know if you were really keen <laughs> um but yeah out, out with that you know just give us a just give us a, an email and uh we'll answer any questions for you that's smash and thank you very much i think um, we are going to be looking at with a um setting up a subgroup um, looking at environmental matters as well, so maybe it'll be that you know the people in the subgroup want to take that forward as well. But thank you. For yeah, that. absolutely. That that would be fantastic to get in contact with them. Great stuff. Okay. That's cheers. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any other points on that? No. Okay. So now we come to community partnership updates, and the first item is over to Matt, and that is for board development sessions. Thanks, Chair. I'm going to try and can everybody see that? Okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Just very briefly to go through um, the presentation um, regarding the, the community board update. Just to, you'll be aware the last time we had a discussion uh, in relation to the community board development program. Um, it's just to get, give you an update that we're, we're now in the development stage of the, the the program itself in terms of our the, the the new portal that we're setting up in relation to the community board development process. Uh, it'll bring together all the resources that were addressed and, and come out during the training needs analysis that people had had considered. And, and we'll share credentials, which is like kind of login details for those who are interested in accessing some of the information that becomes available. And we'll do that as soon as we can um, as, this, as this moves forward. The next stage we'll do this. This gives you an idea of what it will look like online. Um, you, you'll see the different um, areas of, of the, the, the engagements that will be part of the dashboard that will be available to all people who want to access that. That just gives you some examples of the areas it will cover. And there you would click on one of those boxes, one of those tiles, and behind that you'll have some information relating to that particular subject. So that, that's that, that's how it's going to look going forward. Um, again, as I say, click on the, 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 the tiles below. Again, this gives you some information pertaining to that. Um, these are most of the issues that we've identified through the training needs analysis. And as we take that forward to the next stage, um, we're looking. For, we're going to be looking for people from the community boards to be part of a testing program that we'll do earlier in the new year. So we'll be asking for volunteers for that. Again, you don't have to volunteer tonight, but if you are interested in being a volunteer for that, then let us know. And when we're testing this before it gets launched, um, we'll, we'll, we'll give you an opportunity to come along, try and use the system, see how it is. And give us your feedback on that. That will help determine how the actual system will look. And then hopefully by around about April time, we'll be able to have a formal launch of the system um, for uh, across the whole of North Lanarkshire for the, the community board development online system. But also bear in mind information that's available will be accessible in other formats, not just online. If people want it in written format and or one-to-one -one sessions, we will look to try and program program all that kind of information um, in as well. So that's that's the plan. Um, behind that. That's really all I would say on that, Chair, but I'm happy to take any questions. That's great. Any points or questions? 
Nope. I would say that I have used LearnNL in my other capacity, and it's really simple to use. It's really easy to follow. Um, and so, you know, hopefully everybody will be able to get the benefit of it. So that's great. Thank you. OK, moving on to Matt again, and it's the Local Development Programme. Thanks again, Chair. This report was would have been issued if, like, earlier or last week to give you an update on the, the local development programme projects. Just to make you aware, a couple of things in it just to highlight, a couple of things that we wanted to make you aware of that the, a lot of the projects are now moving through to consultation for year one projects. Um, local communities who are potentially affected by a project going forward have been asked for their views on that, on those projects just now. Um, once we have the approval from the consultations, we then move forward to the delivery of the, the, the year one projects. And we're, we're also going to be starting shortly. And the ones I've identified for year two um, is to start the, the design and consultations on as many as we can for year two as well, start them as, as early as possible in the program. So that'll be done probably earlier in the, in the, in the new year. If, if, if we can get the year one projects starting to move forward as best we can. We'll move on to some of the year two projects. Um, the other things to, to highlight there is you, you'll see some changes and some proposals within the appendices, just highlighting some increased budget to some potential projects and a couple of projects being deleted, for example. Um, but there's also in the, the last appendix within the report is the consultation letter. And just to give you an example of the letter that we send out to people that shows you the letter, that, that letter goes out. Um, it gives people who can click on the QR code, which a lot of people are much more familiar with using QR codes now for going into a, <clears throat> a restaurant or somewhere now to register for the for the, the track and trace. Um, it's a similar, very similar approach to that. It takes you to the the designs that are available for the project. And I find it's a really good way of doing that. But again, these designs are available in other formats. We do write to people directly, send it, send it out in written format as well. We also have email addresses that people can write into and people can phone in also there's a phone number that people can phone in if they've got any concerns or any any comments or questions they want to raise about projects. So that was just to give you an, oppor an opportunity to see where we're going with the consultations on that at the moment. That's all I would say on that, Chair. I'm again happy to take any questions. Thank you. Adam? Yeah, thanks for that update, Matt. Um, just two points for me. One, um, as, as, as someone who's recently received one of the, the consultation letters, um, is that the consultation letter refers to a plan. However, the, the letter that's issued by post doesn't include the plan. It directs people to the, the form online. And sometimes the, the picture of the plan that's embedded within the form is really poor re resolution. It's really small and it's not easy to read. And I gave that, that feedback to, to Colin just the other day. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that. And, and the other question I had on the, the local development programme, it's just about the, the process when projects are submitted. So is there a, a discussion that goes on with the relevant service in terms of a contribution possibly from them to maximise the local development programme funding? I'm thinking, for example, as part of the, the project submission, it may well be that um, an area is going to be upgraded that, that should perhaps have been maintained by the service. Um, so it was just to ask if there is that conversation that goes on within the council to maximise the, the funding for the LDP. Yeah, thanks for those questions, Adam. Certainly, thanks very much for your feedback in relation to the consultation. That's very helpful. And we'll make sure that's passed back to the team who are dealing with that, certainly to refine those areas of that. It's, it is a new approach to that, and it is, it's only when we do these kind of things that we get those some issues that, that arise. We we'll have had issues where... Uh, but people that haven't experienced that, so maybe just uh, maybe just for some issues in relation to certain aspects of that. But it's, it's important for us to hear that. So thanks for that, and we'll take that on board. Your your second point, um, yes, we absolutely do speak to other services about the work that we do in relation to delivering projects, and uh, some a, a number of the projects across the nine board areas, we will we will be a, a contributor to a project that's ongoing because it's it's part of a bigger package of funding that's going towards a. A project in the local development program will only be a small part of that, for example. Um, so yes, we, we do that. Uh, we can think of a number of areas that happens in kind of like play areas, um, the bigger landscape or, or environmental improvements that we're doing. That we'll maybe make a, a smaller contribution to a much bigger 
job that's ongoing. Um, so we do try and tie in as much, and we've got we're, we're developing more links with particularly colleagues in housing and in property in relation to those kind of those kind of projects to the term. It's just to, to say that we're not. I think it's one of the other points was mentioned there. We're not duplicating work that's maybe already planned by somebody else. So we do cross reference the work that we're planning in areas with others. And for talking sake, if there's a, a I'll give you a couple of examples. There's two in Coat Bridge just now that we're doing at the moment. The one that was a, a school was getting developed in Coat Bridge and we contributed towards a turning circle that benefited the wider community, whereas at the same time providing a further resource to the school. So that was one part of the work we did. Another one in Coat Bridge we're doing, which is a, a hard landscape area that's been improved by I think it's about £25,000 contribution from the LDP, but ultimately it's about a £70,000 project. So there, there, are, there is work like that that goes on. And if we identify any opportunities for joint working, we certainly will take it. Thank you. Councillor Goldie? I'm probably going to scare Ali Clark with this one when I say it. <laughs> it's just that in areas where there's a high density of housing, like a sanctuary and whatever, and we identify a local project that's going to be a benefit to the residents and tenants in that, do we approach housing associations or whatever, or does the funding tend to come from council departments? It's just a suggestion, and I'll, I'll give Alec a chance to shout to me later on. <laughs> No, I would certainly, um, to answer the point from as far as the council is concerned, if we're in there and there's, it's quite apparent that the, there is a, another, a, for example, a major landlord in there, then we will certainly approach them to see if we can do some joint work. And we have done that in, in a number of areas in the past. You're on mute, Chair. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody else? Um, I, I had a couple of points that I wanted to raise in a sort of non-chair capacity. Um, the Cadbury Primary School Community Access, could you give us a wee bit more detail about what that, that is? Or, um, I, just, I was kind of interested in that. Um, I'll maybe let you answer that one before I move on. Hi, Hi Chair, I'll take that one. So the, a number of years back, uh, Cora Foundation were using the primary school as a local base in Kerbrain. They had taken um, over one of the bottom classrooms and there was a steady flow and an increase in flow of community members accessing the school. And it was felt at the time that they would uh, really benefit from a separate access point. So that was the original pro the project proposal. It was to develop an access point to allow wider access to the community for the community to that space, out also out with the school time. Unfortunately, the, the allocated funds wasn't enough to deal with the project, and the project is now developed into something slightly different. So the first part of it is potentially looking to replace that access point with the installation of a refurbished modular unit either on the school site or on another site within Cambrian that could be used with uh, for community as a community space. But the situation is ongoing. The cost might be prohibitive on the basis of what we've got available. So uh, there's a partners meeting that was going to be arranged in the coming weeks where we'll bring the relevant and interested bodies together to have a, a conversation and to consider options and how best to address the situation with community space in the short term. That's smashing. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, well, I think we, we, um, we've got two items. The last two items were seeking approval for year two priorities for Oak Road football pitch parking and improvements and Melrose Avenue. I presume that's Melrose Road, actually, or it might be Avenue. Um, I just noted that there's, a, I mean, these are more than double. One of them's more than double what we're sort of allocating on parking for year one, and I was just wondering, is there a particular reason for that? Um, is it just the scale of the requirement, or it seems a lot? It's Melrose Road, is it? Yeah. Yeah, Melrose Road. Apologies, that's my mistake. Um, yeah. The issue, particularly with Melrose Road, is that we are probably looking at four or five different locations at that site. And they're all very relatively small sites. So it's because of the nature of the work. If you were just going to do that project 
and creating the same number of parking bays, for example, you could probably do it for half the price. But because it's dotted about here, there, and everywhere, it's a it's a higher budget as as anticipated for that one. Another one is it's just it's just on scale. Um, yeah. So that that's sort of the, the difference with that one, there. and particularly the Melrose um, one. It's just because I, I was out there, the councillor Goldie were out at that site, along with Colin, and I said, "There's as I say, there's at least four different sites, and it might only be two or three spaces you're talking about doing there, and it's just economies of scale." Um, yeah. Doing a piece of work on that, and that's that's the reasoning behind that one. Okay, that's fine. Is everybody content that we approve those for um, year two? Go ahead. Yep. Any objections? No. Okay. The final point I just wanted to check. I mean, I know the figures are very indicative, Matt. So I know that um, that's the case. But at the moment, with the changes that have been made, it looks like there's going to be a balance of probably just short of a hundred thousand at the end of year one. I'm assuming that that will then be carried forward onto year two. Yeah. At at the moment, Fair. we're still. Yeah. The, the, the short answer is yes. That, that's something we did meet actually about that this morning to look at if you've got any potential underspends then on, on projects and we will look to, to to move that forward. If there's any other projects that we can pick up on before the end of the financial year, then we will try to move those forward as quickly as we can. Any that's underspends, we're looking to carry that forward into future years. Okay. I mean, I, I, you know, on the scale of that, can I carry forward if we are, for example, if the CCTV comes in over the 25 rough, you know, allocation, then presumably we'd be able to just move some um, of the balance across to that, yeah. I, I will be honest. I'm anticipating that the CCTV and CCTV probably will come in pretty much more than than that. So some of the yeah. understanding maybe will be allocated to that, and that's why we do put it in as indicative cost because it does give us in, in our team the we're able to move funds about a bit to try and and ultimately at the end of this financial year we're given indicative cost there, but we are anticipating. Um, for some of the, you might have heard it in the, the press and maybe some of your own experiences, a lot of projects just now are coming in much higher than they've been in previously due to a combination of a, a number of things with COVID and Brexit and all sorts of different things are impacting on the availability of materials. And you're getting some stories about tarmac costing three times as much as it cost before. And so when we, when we used to talk about a parking bay, for example, used to cost us about two and a half thousand pounds per bay. So if we were doing a 10 bay, parking space, you know, that's what we're talking 25, we can get 10 bays for that. Now mm -hmm. we're not going to get anywhere near that for that kind of money. So it, but we do envisage that our costs might be a, a bit higher and we need to, we need to um, prepare for that. But bearing in mind, we also do have funding guaranteed for next year as well going forward, but we'll try and keep the prices as low as we can. That's smashing. Um, okay, Adam, did you want to come in? Thanks. Just um, one more question for me. I don't know if it was specifically from a local development programme, Matt, but we had an exchange of emails about uh, some improvements for Cumberland House Park. Just to see if there was any update on that, maybe even by email after the meeting. Sure, I'm happy to pick up on that just now. I don't, it probably just links into an uh, update I'll give on Recovery NL. It was one of the projects that we identified as being potentially could be supported through Recovery NL. And they are looking at, at doing some work there in terms of new benches, etc. In there, so that's something we'll get more detail on for you when that's when that's more available. But we are keen to progress that. That's great. Thanks. Smashing. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to move on to the local outcome improvement plan, and that's Gary. Thanks, Chair. So an update paper was circulated to board members providing the latest update regarding the local outcome improvement plans. As you'll be aware, the, the LOIP, as they're referred to for all community boards, have now been published on the Council's website. And we also distributed them a couple of weeks back to all board members. Work is now underway to create subgroups linked to our priorities. The subgroups will be a key driver for taking forward local actions to address local needs with a specific focus on addressing and reducing inequalities. In the paper, information is provided about the implementation and operational model that will be used. It highlights the shift to action and the attention for the LOIP to provide focus for the work of the community board going forward, as well as the partnership activity at the local level. A key element of each LOIP is that it enables a more focused approach to be taken 
with one clear set of priorities for Cumbernauld. So just to recap, the, the priorities in the light for Cumbernauld include public and community transport, green space maintenance and environmental quality, youth engagement and consultation, digital inclusion, targeted action within identified communities across the board area, food and financial insecurity, and communication and engagement. So moving forward, officers from the Community Planning Partnership, along with representatives from the board and any interested people from the wider community uh, and organisations for that matter, will be invited to come together to form the subgroups, to progress the identified priorities and the initial actions as contained within the LOIP. Every effort will be taken to connect to existing structures already in place in order to avoid duplication and to involve more people from the wider community. That's going to be a, a key task for us going forward. It's anticipated that some development time will be required to get sub subgroups operational with appropriate local people and the partners involved. Since the LOIP will run through until the end of 2026, there is time to develop plans for the short term, the medium term and the long term. And this is outlined within the paper. The paper also reinforces the importance of ensuring a focus on inequalities and about the need for a targeted approach and intervention. The exact plans for each priority will be determined by the subgroups supported by the community board and officers from the Community Planning Partnership. When looking at all the light information across all nine community boards, we have um, established that there is cross-cutting themes and some of them will be of no surprise to you. They include tackling poverty, digital inclusion, mental health and wellbeing, and young people. The paper also provides initial commentary on these. Also included in the paper is a section on measuring progress, uh, and that's about monitoring and tracking. The plans for this include progress on key updates to be taken to each cycle of the community boards. Six monthly tracking reports will be taken to the NLP Strategic Leadership Group and to the Community Empowerment Committee. An annual report produced and published in line with the requirements for the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, and also a formal review every two years. The template that will be used from today onwards for reporting is within Appendix 2. And within Appendix 3, you will note the local update that has been provided. So it outlines the um, subgroups that we propose to develop and the initial work that's happened to develop the subgroups and the expressions of interest received so far. The plan going forward is for an initial meeting to be arranged in December, with a follow-up meeting in, Jan in January, and following this, the subgroups will create their own meeting schedule to take things forward. So I'm happy to take any questions or comments now. Present. Yeah, Billy. I'm just, uh, you know, uh, what Gary was saying, you know, and I was listening to everything that was included, and the sum up of, you know, different groups and subgroups and what, there was not one mention about the elderly, and I think that's something that needs to be looked at. The elderly seem to be disregarded at the moment, and I'd like some comments on that. Okay. Hi, Hi Billy. Uh, uh, yeah, I understand your point of view. Uh, the LOIP was, a, you know, a very well defined process with significant amounts of engagement with people of all ages, uh, very, very stakeholders and groups from the wider community, and the priorities have been established through that process. Obviously, um, the, at the point in time, the influence in terms of that issue wasn't coming through in terms of a priority, but that's not to say that it isn't already a priority elsewhere. It, it work with older people is a priority for the Council and for many of our partners. And indeed, tonight on the call, we have our uh, partner from CASE, 
who um, <clears throat> Susan, who is the community so solutions lead, and as a part of the community solutions consortium, there is a po big focus on support to the elderly. There is lots of work and projects that are ongoing uh, across many services for that as well. Uh, I think going forward that it will be quite important, Billy, for us not to lose sight of this important area of work, and we would be very keen to have continued dialogue as necessary. And obviously, the review points that we were mentioned as a part of the process might be an ideal opportunity to try and influence change going forward. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Councillor Brackley. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. Um, just uh, looking at the, the local update in Appendix 3, digi digital inclusion isn't there. Um, and so it's to ask why not? <laughs> so what? And also the no returns coming in from youth engagement and consultation. And I'm kind of looking around us that are all here tonight and we're all very, very young at heart. And some of us are a lot younger than some of the rest of us. Um, mm -hmm. It's what is missing is is the young folk, and it's whether or not that. And I know that there there are other organisations throughout Cumbernauld, but it's whether or not to try and see if we can walk into the three high schools who are doing an awful lot of work to you know to kind of bring that into the other organisations like. Um, the youth zone in Abram Hill, you know, different to see if we can encourage them to participate on this, uh, even if it's not coming to these meetings, because maybe that it's not, but to to in, encourage them to be involved in the youth engagement and consultation. So that has two things: digital inclusion, where's it gone, and can we, you know, sort of reach out to the to youth? Thank you, Councillor Bartley. So, um, the situation, Alec, do you want to come in first? Yeah, it might be a good idea. I'm on the digital group from, from uh, our board here, um, and it's a very active group and has had many meetings. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that we have nobody here from the officer's side tonight to present a report. One of the things that we have asked is that another member of uh, this board volunteers to go on to the digital group and to assist that i would think that um i would propose an innis who was on the board from a, on the, the digital group from a different source that she becomes our second member okay is that still yeah. yeah i'm still here i'm happy with that if people are happy with that that would be yep absolutely Okay, um, I had um, first of all had Lindsay, and then I'll come back to other speakers. Yeah, it was just to say, I, I, just to kind of mirror Councillor Barclay. Um, so our MSYP, we, we had an election last night. The results of our MSYP elections were last night. So we now have two. Well, one new MSYP and Emma is is one or seat again. Um, Emma unfortunately was working tonight, so I've got in touch today. So um, we're taking that back. Um, but we are actually we, we've kind of restructured our youth engagement, um, our youth participation within the area. Um, we used to have one forum for the whole area. We split it into three. We've got one for Cosyth, one for Cumbernauld, and one for the Northern Corridor. So we're we're in the process of kind of developing those and and recruiting again. And and as you say, for us, we've had a youth forum for a number of years. I, I only took it over quite recently. Um, but for us, what, one of the main things, actually last April, we were supposed to have a big event in the link with all the schools coming together to try and strengthen the link between the people council or people parliament or whatever's going on in the kind of high schools and ourselves in the youth forums and make sure that those links are stronger. So just to see that work's definitely going on in the background. And, and as I say, Emma would have been here had, had she not been working. And as I say, we're trying to kind of widen it a wee bit and say we've got the MSIPs, but we have a wider youth forum and trying to encourage other young people to come along and and, and tell them it's not as scary as it might seem, you know, when you see all these people in the little squares. So um, I would just say that, you know, like we're, we're, we're working on that in the background. But um, yeah, two new MSYPs and lots and lots of voting throughout, throughout the North. We were, we were really good. We had the best part, of, I think, 16 or 1700 votes cast in the last two weeks. That that was in the kind of North area. So that was something we're really quite proud of. So just fill everybody in. That's brilliant. Can I just come in there just a wee bit, uh, Suzanne? So just um it's because of the good work I know that's going on. Um that's why I felt I if it to make sure that it's linked in with us, uh, because of the, the the strong work 
that is being done with so many of our young people that they get a, a, a bad press sometimes. But when you're actually you're working in the community, you see the, the real excellent work and the, um, how proud you are of our young people. So, so yeah, that's great. And, Thanks, Claire. Yeah, and I'm just like Gary's. It's so it should be there, but it's no. <laughs> I, I was going to say, um, in terms of the updated paper, so we were able to strong arm um, St Lucy's Youth Zone into coming on to the Youth Engagement and Consultation Working Group, and Natalie and Angela both said that they would be happy to help out with that. But Lindsay, I wondered if you would be interested, and maybe if the MSYPs would be interested in actually sitting on that subcommittee. Absolutely, I'd actually, I sent Gary a message about one of the other ones as well, and just saying that as much as I have a real fear of people saying, you know, this is something that young people might be interested in, and then there's other things yeah. they maybe think they aren't. And it's trying to say, and especially for the MSIP, saying you represent not just yourself, but the wider community. And so, as much as it might not be something that historically you would associate as a as an issue young people are, are passionate about, there are things that they are at, at the moment on our, on our youth phone. We've got two young people who are wheelchair users and they have major issues with things like the kind of pavements and the lighting and the kind of streets and stuff. So those kind of committees that maybe wouldn't have necessarily seen like something young people particularly had a strong opinion about, we actually have uh, have a couple of really strong voices at the moment for these things that are traditionally what we would have seen as young people issues. So um, as I say, as much as we've got an MSYP, we're trying to open the race to the young people as well and say, you know, we, we need everybody's voice on this. It's not just, you know, not just you know, one or two, but ab absolutely. Um, I think that's Emma and Shafa are now are one of our new MSYPs yeah. and, and make sure somebody's on that committee, definitely. That sounds brilliant. And I think, Colin, uh, sorry, Gary, when we're setting up those subcommittees, if we make sure that Lindsay's involved in that, so that if you know whatever young people there are out there that are interested can become involved, it would be really brilliant. Chair, um, if I can I just thought... follow up though that, sure. to answer the questions that um, was posed. So, the digital inclusion one is not on it deliberately. It's not been forgotten. It's because there is a thriving digitally local subgroup that's been coordinated in a North Lanarkshire wide context and that, that subgroup that Alex refers to. Um, so each of the nine boards are, um, are, are looking to get at least two uh, um, two people each to represent the board area on that. And I think going forward, they would certainly be looking to get feedbacks coming through that over time. I think that that would be vital. In terms of the, the youth um, engagement part, uh, um, the chair has uh, indicated that we have now got some additional names, which is absolutely great. And just to confirm what Lindsay was mentioning there as well, um, I've had some early negotiations with the CLD managers, and they have agreed to involve um, the local team and local uh, staff involved in the process, which is fantastic. You know, they've got the uh, knowledge and an expertise about working with uh, children and young people. But equally, as Lindsay said, there we'd be very keen to get. Um, young people involved in particular MSYPs and those involved in the engagement structures. And over and above that, in the next few uh, weeks, and as we develop the subgroups, uh, we will be doing a mapping exercise to begin with for all of them to try to identify who else could contribute to it. And then there will be every effort made to try and bring them on board. Smashing. Great, thank you. OK, I've got Adam and I have Councillor Goldie. Yeah, thanks. Just a, a question for Gary, or it might be more appropriate for the communication and engagement subgroup. But just to ask if we've got a list of stakeholders who we plan to engage with on the, the local outcome uh, improvement plan. Um, and if we do, then is it possible to circulate that? Because possibly we can expand it um, to, to be a bit more inclusive of the community. Thanks. Yes, Adam, uh, the process that we established has been well recorded and documented. So every single um, contributor to the previous parts of the process uh, is available for us. And we've got lists of all them already from the previous work. The first part of um, the process in terms of the paper and the request to take forward a, a, work, a short term working group to try to do that and to find solutions for that. We'll certainly look at that as a starting point. So uh, there's all that information is available for each of the nine local boards and locally for our own areas. Uh, um, Colin, myself, and Roz has available a whole network um, 
list of organisations that we're linked in with, as, as has Vanel and many other people. So we would be hoping that all of the available intelligence will be used to shape things going forward for that part. So it's a good point, though, because I didn't necessarily touch on that. So if anyone is interested in joining that working group, please feel free to get in touch or to post your name on the comment bar. Great. Councillor Coulter. And just going back on the, the youth participation, I'm I'm conscious that we, we tend to pick one or two young people and say, right, you're you're the youth of Cumbernauld, you tell us whatever. And our uh, members of the Scottish Youth Parliament have a lot on their plate as well. You know, they've got their parliamentary stuff, they've got all the other stuff. Uh, and schools always run into things like prelims and exams or whatever. So it's just really to, to ask... Gerard, on the changes to the school curriculums with the Friday afternoons, is there an opportunity to engage some of the school pupils in something on that that could feed into the uh, local area partnerships or boards or whatever we are now? Uh, you know, because it might give a, a broader base, a broader consensus on stuff. And just referring back to the Schools Act uh, twenty. 21 thing that we, we had there. The pupils right from primary one right through the school um, classes were absolutely fantastic in their views in the environment. And I'm sure that if there was something that we could embrace and encourage or whatever, it may actually involve more young people, but I don't know how that would fit in with the, the Friday afternoon. Brother, your, any thoughts on that, Gerald? Um, Kerry, you okay if I respond? Um, Please, yeah. So, so um, the answer is yes, it can be, but because we'll, it doesn't need to be just about the Friday afternoon, um, we do a lot of questionnaires with children, young people um, online. Um, so with that sort of forum, which is actually the most successful forum, if it's done the right way, where there's not a lot of questions, um, it's targeted. Um, you'll find that a lot of people will engage with that. So it doesn't need to be that Friday afternoon. It, it can just be about um, setting up um, a questionnaire that can go out to all or targeted groups in certain areas or whatever. Because of the technology we've now got, um, that can be done. So an answer, yes, but I wouldn't just leave it to the Friday afternoons. I would actually try and do it in a more general way, would be my suggestion. Thank you. Um, okay, Lindsay, you want back in again? I was just really quickly on that point. Um, we during the kind of SYP elections, where we we were in and around um, a number of the schools, and um, we've had a really really good response for a number of the humanities departments. And we were kind of trying to see whether it's kind of Scottish Youth Parliament or things like this. At the end of the day, young people have the opportunity to get hands on practical real life experience of being involved in these things and being involved in democracy and being involved in, you know, th these kind of opportunities. So, and, and we had a number of the schools were really, really keen to to kind of continue that, not just the kind of two weeks of voting, it's how do we how do we embed that? Um, I know Greenfall specifically were saying, you know, they want to make sure there's, and first I said, you're a few sessions on SYP, telling them all about it. So this is the kind of thing that potentially you could you could build into things like that and say there is, you know, there's a whole subject, you know, a whole kind of, we must subject there that really, really support this kind of interaction, and and so that that would be my idea to, to kind of tie into the skills and try and tie into those departments and subjects that that kind of reflect what it is we're doing here. If that makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Any other points on this one? Okay, so yeah, so if anybody's interested in joining any of the subgroups, please go ahead and put your details in. Um, and hopefully we can get those up and running very shortly. Okay, there you are. Um, right, moving on, we're going to go to Colin now, and it's the budget listening events feedback. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair, for that. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to keep this brief because um, most folk would have got the papers that were sent out, and, uh, and if you didn't, we can... Send them out again, so that's not an issue. Um, but as I say, I want to keep this brief. Gerald's already outlined, and I think, you know, um, Gerald, Gary and myself would like to thank everybody who participated. It was a really good event, about 12 people or so, but it was really interactive, thought-provoking, good ideas, and just 
people that just wanted to make a difference and see the impact and maybe look at how we can maybe do things differently. So I think, you know, on behalf of the council, um, thanks very much to everybody who contributed. It was a really worthwhile exercise. Um, there were, and that was in the 4th of November as well. So it's not that far away, uh, not that long ago, I should say. So there were four main discussion points, four main questions really, you know, so I'm just going to very briefly touch on um, some some cursory points on them and really just give you the kind of questions. So nothing of this is uh, going to be a major surprise, I would imagine, but it's just very interesting anyway. So it's what council services people value most in the community, including culture and leisure services. So the whole idea was to get people involved and interact and give us a view there. And one of the things we really want to emphasize is that there's no wrong or right opinion. It was just about everybody's view was respected. So just a couple of things that came across, you know, um, the, the value most about elderly care, waste collections, mental health and well-being, um, three things out of about maybe nine or ten. Um, so that was really interesting. I'm not going to labour these points because it's all on the kind of the, the report that went out, but if you want to ask any questions, we can do that afterwards. Um, service delivery priorities, um, protection of statutory services, addressing inequalities across communities, and addressing climate change and extreme weather events such as flooding were three of the elements that um, came out of that discussion. Views on the types of services the council could reduce or stop. Now, there weren't any direct views on this topic. However, there was a real discussion on the ways the NLC could be more focused in on local community engagement in the, about the delivery of services and maybe delivering things in maybe a not not a cleverer way, but a, a, more, a more kind of honed way and a more focused way, but but really pinpointing the the the, the communities within that and asking folk. And um, so, for example, um, there was a there was a a good discussion about people not utilising in, in recycling bins properly has led to more contamination thus leading to costing more money. So effectively, folk have been not putting the proper things in the recycl recycling bins. And then if we, when it goes to the recycling centres, it can't go through because it's contaminated with other objects. And obviously that's it's a waste of money, waste of time. So, and one of the big things was about education. And we all know that's really difficult because we need to get people to actually do the right things so we can save some money in the, in the longer term. But I think the key message here was, although we know um educating the public can be challenging and getting them to do the right things it's a it's an absolute priority and that's something we really really need to be focused in on so the right information is there at the right time um how communities can work with public services and um, to share and support the delivery of services that are important to local people and again it's very much about community engagement so communities have lived experiences within where they where they do live, and the council should use structures such as community councils to better effect in local decision making. I think it came across, you know, that there's, you know, people have lived experience. They know, they've lived in somewhere for maybe 20, 30 years. They know what's going on. Um, if if the council were to ask um, maybe about what's going on in the local community, they would know there's maybe a potential of not necessarily saving money, but a bit doing things differently in areas. Um, and that there's a, and this is on this is on the the paperwork it came out, but there was a perception that decisions are made in communities without quality consultation methods. Community engagement was highlighted very much through the discussion. Um, I, I'm not going to labour the points because you've all got the information there. If you didn't get it, we will we will make sure you do receive it. So, but again, just wanted to thank everybody who participated in a real open and honest discussion. Um, and the points raised will go forward to NLC along with the other opportunities that folk had across the authority uh, to voice their opinions in relation to the council budget setting process. So thank you very much. I know that was very brief, but I, you know, I didn't want to kind of labour the points, but I'm happy to um, answer any queries, questions that folk have got. Okay, um, Adam. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Colin, for that um, update. Um, just one point I wanted to raise, um, following on from uh, what you said about consultation and engagement, and it's something that I've, I've raised before. Um, and at times, I find that the the consultation and engagement with community councils is poor, and sometimes verges and non-existent. Um, and I think that there's some quite wins there, just in terms of you know making sure that 
uh, some of the, the council departments are aware that there are community councils operating in an area and have contact details for them. So one example of that would be on roads. Uh, whenever roads are looking at doing works in the local area, about making sure that we are included in information that they pass out to, to councillors and other stakeholders as well. So I just wonder if, if that could be could be done uh, just to make sure that um, council services and, and departments are aware of um, kind of anchor organisations in each community who they should be engaging and working with. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. I mean, I think that, you know, certainly we can uh, pass on that. And that's absolutely a very valid point, you know, and across North Lancashire, we've got a varied number of community councils, but there's also quite a number of areas that don't have community councils, so that community voice is not necessarily there. But certainly it's a very valid point, you know, and I think that, you know, we can, um, um, through Gary and Matt, we can pass this pa pass that on to the appropriate team, um, to the appropriate kind of um, officers, and, and maybe look if, if that's feasible to actually, um, to actually provide that information. Um, as we kind of move forward, hope that's okay. Um, I'm sure. Hopefully, Matt would be able to support us in that and kind of take that forward. Thank you, Councillor Goldie. Just I would echo that from Adam. I know that certainly when I get this stuff through in my ward, to try and send them out to community councils and community groups and all that to update them and things like roads and various other things that may be of interest to them. Uh, Sometimes it's maybe a day or two late because I've never checked my emails for the top down around the bottom up. <laughs> but, but I do try and get it out. But it is valid because I think community councils, because uh, they can disseminate the information even further. And there's also the role for the community board as well. Like if we're talking about the community board being good for signpost and consultation and all that, it would be nice to see that role expanded over the time. Uh, but it would be worthwhile. Absolutely, Councillor Absolutely. Goldie. And I think that, um, you know, as we move forward with the local outcome improvement plans and obviously the community boards in general, you know, community engagement is, is, is absolutely vital. The voice of local communities is going to be absolutely vital. The community boards are going to be m more important than ever, you know, in localised opinion and decision making. And yes, not everybody agrees with what everybody says, but at least if there's a, a voice there and folk folk feel respected and that they can kind of put that across, I think that's where we, we, we want to kind of move forward to and um, having a you know, having a, 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 a more positive, positive voice um, across across the, the board, um, I would say. Okay. Anything else on that subject? Are we happy to move on? Chair, can I just say briefly, um, we'll pick up on the points that Colin's been commenting on, and, and rightly so. It's, it's certainly something we'll pass on to our colleagues and other services about ensuring that their engagement is as wide as possible. It's something we are working on as well to try and have you know, some kind of common engagement register that we have, you know, within within the, within the council. That if a consultant, if we're consulting on something, it should more or less be the same people that roads, education, housing, the MDLs are consulting on. It's the same people, and that's and that, that is predominantly what we do have. Community council have been slightly different because they're statutory consultees in, in relation to a number of things. That's why they have been probably kind of. Uh, dealt with in a kind of different way, but there's no way, no reason why that can't be encompassed into what the rest of us are doing. So we'll make sure we can do as much as we can in relation to that. That's great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Okay, Matt, I think we're back over to you for the next item, which you is done, can I come in before you end the meeting? Well, of course you can, Billy. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Just before you end the meeting. Go for that. Oh, we're not. We're not finished the meeting. There's still. Items yeah. on the agenda. Do you want to come just, to um, inform everybody? I apologise that my internet and my broadband has been out for the past month, so I've missed that many meetings. It's unbelievable, and not be able to get any details of any emails that have been sent out. Um, so I've not been able to send in reports that I've got from different, you know, people that's phoned me and made complaints about different things. Um, if you want me to wait to the end and bring them up, or I can bring them up just now. Can we pick them up under the OCB, Billy? Is yeah, that, okay? that would be great. Brilliant, yes. Okay, thank you. That's great. Um, yeah, so I think we're now going to Matt for Recovery NL funding update. Thanks, Chair. 
Okay, just a, a couple of things to update in, in relation to recovery NL. Um, just to let you who, who are aware, this is a additional budget that came um, to be utilised across the nine boards from the council in relation to environmental works, but to support the work of local communities and the groups that are operating, providing such great work across the whole of the nine board areas. And that's what this funding was about. Um, there's a th kind of three areas I wanted to pick up on briefly. The first one was the um, in the summer, you'll be aware, a number of you will be aware you applied for funding for um, materials to help with, with activities and litter pickups and other work that you were doing in the area. Um, there was issues in relation to that in terms of ordering the materials and delivery, etc. Um, we have done most of that now. That said, it has been, has been picked up on and most of the deliveries have been undertaken. There are still a few outstanding um, and that will be addressed as soon as we can through our street scene and land management team. Um, with an environmental asset. So we are moving as, on that as, as, as best we can at the moment. And we do apologise for the delay and the issues relating to getting that, that those materials out to local groups. The second point I wanted to pick up on was, you know, one of the things we determined was, that, you know, we've, we, we did ask people what the kind of things they wanted and we went about trying to procure it. Um, what we decided was to, another way of doing that was to give funding to local groups rather than ask, tell us what the kind of thing you wanted. But, Tell us the kind of things you'd you look to buy and then provide funding directly to local groups, up to £4,000 per, per group across North Lanarkshire and give the opportunity then for those groups to then buy the materials that they wanted to use themselves for the work that were undertaken in the areas. Um, that just closed a couple of days ago, like the 19th. That, that, that scheme closed and to date we've had well over, we've had over 60 applications for funding and that, which we're quite pleased with that level of 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 uh, feedback from the local community groups across as they across North Lanarkshire, so over over sixty groups have applied for that funding. We will be assessing those applications as soon as we can over the next couple of weeks, and then funding will be issued to the successful groups in relation to to, to that funding. They say groups can could have applied for up to four thousand pounds. That's that that's that money that needs to be spent over the, the winter. Or in, or in, there's no big urgency to spend that funding. That's that the groups can 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 retain the funding and buy things that they can use over different seasons of of the of the coming year. Um, we will get the money out as quickly as we can, but it's up to the group then to um to to spend on the things that that's included within their applications. So that's certainly something else that we're we're, we're keen to. To take forward, and as I say, very we're really happy with the number of groups that have come back and ap applied for that funding, and it really shows the the breadth of community involvement in the work that's been undertaken in local areas about the, the, the to support the recovery NL approach and the work that's getting done in local local communities. It's fantastic. There's a, also within that that funding, there's a bit of winter resilience element to it, and if people wanted to buy funding, buy materials for that to support winter resilience in communities, then that can be included within that. That just takes me on to the third part of what, what the update is in relation to winter resilience, and again, this is this is part of Recovery NL, um, where we, a few years ago, some of you may have been involved in some groups that uh, Colin Bruce was in particular was involved in this, and contacted a number of local groups, particularly in our rural areas, to support winter resilience in rural, rural areas and having winter resilience packs, basically big bags that were had shovels, um, high vis gloves, torches, etc. Things that could be used for a, in a local community who couldn't get out to access things. It would be in a place that was accessible within a local community that, that local people could go and get and use. We did that a few years ago in our more rural communities. What we've done now as part of of Recover NL is we've widened that now and we've contacted a, quite a, a number of anchor organisations and across the, the areas. And I think we've got about 18 groups, further groups have now came forward who want to host winter resilience packs within within their local communities. And this is within any setting now, it doesn't have to be a rural setting, it could be any setting. Um, it's really as groups. The, the, the groups that we've contacted for that are groups who have got premises, groups who have got somewhere they can store something and people can go and, 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 and get a hold of some of the stuff that they need. So that's the next day. We're, we're dealing with that at the moment. Um, hopefully that will be completed. We'll start ordering the materials for that next week and get that distrib distributed before Christmas. And all those groups will have bags. They'll be, they'll be retained and we'll, we'll be able to try and support in a bit, just in a, a small way, it probably is, but we just think it's additionality to what's already out there. But we think it's a good use of the funding that our local communities benefit from having these kind of materials 
in the area that if there is a, a major winter event and they need some support, then it, there's something there to give some support on that. And we'll monitor that, how that works. And we'll, over the, the next few years as well, we're, through the local development programme, we can put a bit of money from the local development programme aside to, to restock that to, to ensure that, it, that it's kept up to date and people have that in place. And if we need to expand it, then we can do that as well. Um, so that's really, the, yeah, that's really just the update on um, Recover NL. The exception, another point, as Adam mentioned earlier, was about uh, coming all towns part. There's a few projects we've identified across North Lanarkshire that will, will also be done under the Recover NL banner. And the one in Cumbernauld Towns Park that Adam referred to earlier is one we hope to pick up on as well. Thanks, Chair. Marshall, thank you very much. Adam? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so, two questions I have. One is, uh, what is the process for that in terms of um, organisations requesting that additional winter resilience kit? Um, and uh, whether now or, or EOB, I'm not sure what part of the agenda is the best for this specific question, but um, in terms of the Council's um, public waste bin strategy, um, I know that um, Council has decided to um, go out and consult and engage on that. And I just wanted to ask what stage that's at, what format that's going to take, and if Community Councils and this Community Board will be part of that consultation. Thanks. Matt, are you happy to pick that up just now? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can certainly pick up the first point. The second point, um, I'm not 100% sure of the arrangements that are in place for that, Adam, but I can certainly make sure we find out and get that shared with the board. Uh, we can get as much information out of that as we can. Uh, in terms of that consultation, it's not something I'm, I'm familiar with immediately, but we can certainly, the team will certainly make sure we get information on that and share that with, with yourself and the board about that going forward. Um, the first point in terms of access and winter resilience packs, we contacted that we have a list in conjunction with our colleagues in Van L, a list of what we call, as you're aware, you used the term yourself, I think, earlier, about anchor organisations, and where we contact a number of groups who have premises that we know that, that, where they, can, they could potentially store um, a, a winter resilience kit. If you're, if, they, if you're a group that is that and you weren't on that list and you're interested, just let us know about it, and we can certainly make sure you're included in that. If you've got a group who's interested in that, we were going on the basis of um, the anchor organisations that we had in our, our file and voluntary action North Lanarkshire had, and we kind of merged those two um, as, as the groups who had premises who could be able to accommodate that. But if there's other groups there who could, who could support that, then we're happy to look at that as well. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And, and just on that point, I think as well that it might be useful if there's a list of those groups. So, for example, in, in Coldrum, uh, I'm the chair of Coldrum Community Council, there are a number of organisations that may well be hosting those kits, you know, YMC or some of the local churches, um, but I wouldn't know that. So it's just about how we communicate that those kits exist. Thanks. Yeah, once we finalise this process, Adam, and we will have a list of where those kits are, and we'll make sure that, that information is shared with everybody to, to ensure they know where they all are. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Goldie. Thanks, Chair. Just uh, on the point on the bin rollout, had moved the motion, which is unanimously accepted at the Council, and the motion stated will communicate with the, will uh, discuss whatever with the community boards, consult with the boards and other local groups, but uh, I haven't heard anything at all about how that consultation discussion or what groups have been approached to that. Uh, there was a and it's supposed to report back to Environment and Transportation Committee. But I've just had one, there was nothing in that. So I, I don't, Matt, the answer is I don't know, Adam. I'd hoped that the boards might have been approached by now. Uh, but I don't know. But I I'm maybe can maybe chase that up and say the fact the motion was passed, where are we? When are we going to consult? Yeah, we're happy to pick that up, even in conjunction with yourself, Councillor Goldie, you wanted to give us even even give us a wee note on that situation, we'll chase that up and find out what's happening with it. Yeah, that's fine, Matt, I've got no issues with that. Thank you. Okay, moving on, um, it is over to Gary on participatory budgeting. Thanks, Chair. Uh, a briefing paper regarding participatory budgeting was circulated 
along with the meeting paperwork, and I would like to briefly draw to your attention uh, at the following highlights. So, following approval of the mainstream participatory budgeting proposals at Council Committee, there is now a requirement for community boards to consider how participatory budgeting will best work in the local area and to establish a suitable task and reference group to take this forward. The establishment and operation of this group will be supported through the community board development sessions that Matt referred to earlier. This will ensure that all members will have the required skills and knowledge to fully participate. As you're aware, participatory budgeting is about local people having a direct say in how public money is spent and it supports active citizenship within North Lanarkshire, helping build more active and stronger communities. Where appropriate and subject to available budgets being agreed by the community boards, PB is one mechanism that can be used to prioritise and deliver projects and will be deployed when required and suitable for local circumstances. Going forward, the community board will direct PB delivery and this will be funded by the local development programme budget. It's important to mention that this is not a separate funding source and no additional funding is currently available for PB delivery. In the future, we hope that funding from community benefits and other sources of internal and external funding can be added to this. Also, I would like to highlight that the local development programme will not be fully delivered using PB process, and normal arrangements will remain in place for certain types of projects. This isn't to ensure that the local development programme retains the ability to proactively target issues within the communities as and when they arise. Whilst PB can involve a public vote on projects, it's also important to highlight that this will include the ongoing engagement with community boards on budget allocation decisions. As such, the PB process may not be the most appropriate delivery mechanism on every occasion and will instead become part of a suite of delivery options. Each community board will contribute towards the decision making on how PB operates within their area and how this is focused to meet the local place-based and thematic priorities. Where appropriate, our community board may decide that one of our proposed subgroups can take on PB delivery role and therefore there may not be a need to establish a new task and reference group that can be decided by us. The decision will be made locally by each community board to best reflect their local structure and needs. Whether an existing subgroup or a new task and reference group is used to take the PB process forward, there will be a requirement for a council officer uh, to be a member of this. This is to provide both guidance and advice on the PB process and to ensure that appropriate financial governance takes place. The community board is asked to consider this update and to approve the establishment of the appropriate participatory budgeting task and reference group or similar, along with the governance processes with implementation supported through the community board development programme and by the community partnership team. I'm happy to take any questions now. Thanks, Gary. Anybody? No. Happy to um, support the recommendations. Could I just ask a few questions, Suzanne? Certainly, yeah. Um, PB has been on the agenda for a number of, year, of years now. Now, Cornerstone's been funded by the Scottish Government to deliver on PB in a very small manner compared to maybe some of the percentages that you're talking about, Barry, eh, Gary. Um, and that's recently been agreed that that would be extended going forward um, for the next year anyway. The constraints that you've described there, Gary, to my understanding is that PB is meant to be an independent process coming from the grassroots and for the community to be involved at various levels to make sure that it's the community voice that's heard. 
from what you've just described there is quite a constrained approach to people having information or processes that would maybe get them to the end result. And you're referring to the Scotland Act, etc. The Scotland Act was meant to provide communities with a reinvigorated voice of the issues in community, not to shore up council budgets, to be quite honest with you. So I think we need to explore a wee bit more about the wider parameters of how the budgets in a in a, a context of local decision making are really being taken forward. Appreciate your honest okay. comments there, Mary. Um, I certainly have taken a note of them down and I will uh, get back to you once I've had a conversation with the appropriate officers. Now, what I can say is that the the process that we refer to as North Lanarkshire Council uh, PB process, which has went through uh, the committee process and has been approved by committee of the council. Uh, but we do want to ensure at the local level that the way that we operate it within um, Cumbernauld is that we try to get it right and we want to find ways there to, to look at this going forward. Uh, my understanding is that you have had a, a meeting with my colleague Ross Dunnett um, about the the experience that happened, um, you know, in terms of the process and the delivery at Cornerstone. No. Um, all right. Okay. I've I've missed, I've maybe, all right. I've maybe misunderstood. Happy to talk to anybody, but you know, from writing the original bid, I, I mean, you're you are aware that there's a whole platform, uh, the Scottish government support on the the internet around PB, and about the process and the training and all the things that go on around how the Scottish Government might see how things are going forward. Yes, uh, we are aware of Consul and we have certainly got the, the, the capacity there to use that for undertaking PB related votes and polls. Um, we've also got, as you're aware... I know, but sorry, my understanding is that doesn't work very well, Gary. Yeah. On our, vote, on our voting... Um, we use we use the survey monkey. Now we've got tremendous results from the fact that we're giving out grants to local groups, and the local groups are putting in applications. Billies is involved in this for them to tell us we've got independent um, community input making the decisions. Cornerstone has got nothing to do once the applications come in. It's a separate panel that look at that and they're scored. Now, the local groups are saying, now it's, I'm talking specifically about we've got, say, a £1,000 or £500 or whatever to give out. We've had a tremendous response from local groups. We've helped over 50-odd local groups get a grant over the past three years. Now, the votes that we are getting consistently on, I think we're in round four, we're going into round four in January, is over a thousand and a half votes, maybe at a time. That's that's enormous. Uh, so that's real people power, uh, Gary. So I think we need to be very careful that we, we as a board are very aware of all the background to how PB is being supported at a national level looking at how P PB has been taken forward locally and going forward, looking at what you might be proposing, but it has to be inclusive. What you've just described there is, here's our model. I, I Mary, take that on board, Mary. Do you allow me to sort of interject at this point? I think that obviously you've got a great deal of experience in this subject and something that we would obviously want to work along with you. Yeah. So can I suggest that when we set the subgroup up, that maybe you would want to put your name forward for it, and then that would allow us to maybe start to look at this in a bit more depth? Yeah, I might have had a bit more um, input up until now, Suzanne, but this year I took really bad COVID, so I was out here for five months. Then I had really bad, the last meeting I had really severe gastroenteritis, so I'm picking up on things now. 
I'm a wee bit behind with where you all have might have been. I, I will look at the YouTube uh, recording for the last meeting. But we have to get to the heart of what is PB all about, and it isn't about showing up council budgets. I think I, I think your point's well made, and I think, as I say, if we maybe set up the, the subcommittee and get you on to then that would be really helpful. I'm happy to do that, but I'm just saying it's a Thank chance you. to get things right and maybe have some grassroots... Um, what, how can I put it? Some grassroots investment that will go to grassroots and not be an idea, an abstract idea that might be ticking a box in a strategy, but really at the heart of it, it's about if you study the Scotland Act, it's really about reinvigorating democracy and also in a European context. That's where we need to be going. Really helpful, Mary. Thank you for that. I'm going to move on to Matt. I think he okay. had is it. Yeah, Matt I had just, his hand up there. I just very briefly, Chair, just to pick up on the, the points that um, Gary and Mary have mentioned. We're, we're very much aware that the Scottish Government in, uh, input in relation to participating in the budget, and we work closely with the Scottish Government, COSLA, in relation to that. And we're also we're, we're part of a, a working group at the moment with um, with a, an English university is now assessing the console, the use of console, etc. Because we recognise there are challenges in that, and it's within uh, within our team we certainly recognise that using various methods of consultation is is certainly the way forward. Not just basing it on the console system, but other other methods of engagement as well as something else that we would certainly consider. Uh, and, it's, and you're right, it's, it's certainly not about showing up council funds, and that's certainly not the intention behind the, behind the council's move in, in relation to determine how we, we utilise uh, participatory budget. It's about identifying the appropriate sources of funding in terms of mainstreaming that approach. And, and the, the group they were talking about taking forward that Gary was talking about, I think is a, a very important next step to allow us to do that to ensure optimum levels of community involvement in taking that forward. Thanks very much, Matt. That's really okay. helpful. Um, can I ask then if anyone is interested in participating in that group, if they are a contact Gary, I've put their name in the chat bar. And I'll put my name down, Suzanne, if that's all right. Thank you. That's really helpful. So will I. Great. That's Alex as well. Thank you for that. Okay, and myself, else, Suzanne. I'm involved in it. Okay, if anybody else wants to then please go ahead and, and we can take this matter forward. Okay, Gary, is that you done on that one then? Yeah. Okay, so um, moving on to the next item, we don't have any petitions, which is um, fine. Um, and we're going to move on to input from our community planning partners. Now, um, we have a written report from Strathclyde Fire. Um, so, sorry. Scottish Fire, I always get that one wrong. Um, I don't know if anybody has any comment to make on that. We don't. I don't think we've got anyone from the fire service, have we? No. No. Okay. So we'll just note that update, and I think that was particularly um, interesting, um, especially around the um, smoke, the, the, the light smoke detection um, piece that uh, we were we were uh, looking at there. Um, and we have um, Susan from Scottish Police. Hi. Hi, Susan. Do you want to give us an update? Thank you, firstly, for the invitation to the meeting. Um, and just by way of introduction to the group, uh, I'm Susan Ray. I'm the new Community Police Inspector for Cumberland Local South and Northern Corridor area. I uh, have been taking over from Neil McLeod just sort of mid-September, so this is my first community board. Um, meeting and I'm still kind of very much sort of just trying to get to grips with what's going on in the local area um, and obviously kind of haven't got my team back from COP26 or sort of looking forward you know just to sort of pushing forward some new initiatives kind of growing in the, the next few months so I'll just kind of give you a wee summary of um, crime reports from the post incidents since the sort of last um, meeting which is kind of at the 1st of September so in total there's about 471 crime reports raised for uh, the Cumberland area, uh, just breaking that down into specific wards. So for Ward 2, there was 117 crime reports. Um, that includes one serious assault, um, and that was an incident that stemmed from a work-related dispute um, where a 53-year-old male was assaulted um, and a 43-year-old male was arrested for that. It was an isolated incident and there was no wider community impact for that one. 
In Ward 2, in relation to sort of times of dishonesty, there, there was one housebreaking within the Dulles of the area, um, a theft of a motor vehicle and a further attempt theft of a motor vehicle. For Ward 3, there was 213 calls, which included three serious assaults. Two of those were linked incidents. It was uh, stemmed from a neighbour dispute, uh, where a 32-year-old male and a 26-year-old male engaged um, in an altercation, um, resulting in sort of serious injuries. Both persons were arrested. And further engagement was undertaken with the housing, uh, which has affected the tenancy of one of the, the males, and that happened within the Cabrain area. Uh, for Ward 3, there had been um, a, a spate of uh, housebreakings. There were three housebreakings actually kind of connected to public houses, um, and there was two males identified and arrested for that. It was actually males that were travelling from the Cote Bridge area um, and targeting pubs within this area. Um, in relation to sort of drug recoveries, we do continue to work um, and develop and progress intelligence regarding drug supply in the area, and so we've had some kind of good results within the kind of reporting period. Um, so following intelligence development, there was two warrants uh, recently executed in Condorit area, which resulted in the arrest of a 37-year-old female. She was found in possession of significant quantities of drugs, um, as well as significant amounts of cash. Uh, so she's been arrested and reported to Procreative Fiscal and a disclosure will go to the housing in relation to her tenancy. Um, following a road traffic incident, there was a 32 year old male who was uh, arrested having been found in possession of significant dealer quantities of drugs uh, and also had a knife within the vehicle and that happened within the Green Falls area. And moving on to Ward 4, uh, there has been 141 calls. Uh, those included one serious assault um, and that actually happened within a kind of local high school. It was a teacher was assaulted by one of the pupils within, um, and that pupil has been reported to the children's reporter. Uh, there was four housebreakings within that area. Um, one resulted in a 34-year-old female being arrested, um, whereby she was sort of forced into a property via an insecure window. And uh, again, recently acting in intelligence, um, our plainclothes team here. Um, arrested a 40-year-old female and a 19-year-old male who were found uh, in a vehicle in dealer, or, or possession of dealer quantities of drugs, which include cannabis and white powder, and they were actually observed dealing to one of the locals there. Just in general terms, we have seen, um, we've had several incidents reported um, from members of the public who have fallen victim to a WhatsApp um, scam. And the, sort of the part of the scam is that the victims are contacted by an unknown number via WhatsApp and it's the, prepared, the person's purporting to be a family member, the name is the sort of son or daughter, um, and then they go on to say that they've kind of lost their phone, this is a new number, and they make money transferred to certain bank accounts. This isn't certainly targeted towards Cumbernauld. We have had um, a series of incidents reported across the division. I think we're up to about 22 just now, and there is a fruit fraud team are looking at those collectively. Um, and the work that they've done just now sort of identifies that the recipients of the money are actually kind of out with the country, but there is work on board in relation to that just now. So it would just really be to pass that message out to kind of group members, just to be aware of that scam. Obviously, not respond to um, the chats and just sort of ensure the identity of any kind of caller or, or, or unknown numbers before they engage with them. Um, we've also seen a, a, a rise in theft of partials. I think it's just kind of coming into that time of the year. People are obviously getting lots of deliveries to their houses. Um, some couriers sort of leave the parcels on the doorsteps. So we've, we've had a few reports of um, theft of parcels from doorsteps. Um, so again, there has been some advice circulated on social media, but obviously if that can kind of be spread out to kind of group members, just to be aware of that. And the advice that we would give in that is obviously if you're kind of arranging for a, a, you know, a delivery, if you can try and make sure that you're in or give the courier company sort of alternative arrangements, you know, like a neighbour or drop-off point, etc. And again, that's not specifically targeted to our area, but it is um, kind of seen across the, the division. Um, there has been a number of updates provided to secondary school children. Um, over 2,000 children have been provided with inputs in relation to internet safety, social, social media use, uh, including the sort of sharing of images that our safer communities team took that task on, um, and the feedback from those would be positive. Um, and just some things that we've got um, on the go at the minute, um, or kind of planned activities. So in response to a spike in um, calls for Cumbernauld Shopping Centre, um, basically in relation to sort of disorder, dishonesty calls, we have now, we're trialling a dedicated town centre officer. Um, so that's PC Simon Finlay, and since he's returned from COP26, he's sort of taken on this role. 
um, and he will be the sort of the town centre officer. We're going to kind of trial that for around about two months, and then we'll sort of review uh, what our call demand has been to see whether we're going to make that a permanent uh, fixture. But PC Finlay will certainly take ownership of all inquiries stemming from the town centre, um, and he will actively engage with the Saturday night project, which is held at the Trice, which obviously got about 200 kids going to it. And they hope to kind of build positive relationships with the young people. So if you see Simon wandering around the town centre, please, please feel free to have a chat with him. Um, and we've also got a kind of joint initiative um, on the go at the minute. There will be a, kind of, a few days of action at the start of December, uh, working with trading standards. And it's really to kind of try and do some safeguarding work around about vulnerable persons being targeted by bogus callers. Um, so the plan is that we're going to um, um, jointly visit the independent post offices and offer uh, advice regarding the banking protocol. This is a protocol that's been established for a few years now. Um, and banks and post offices affiliated, affiliated to Royal Mail were all sort of signed up to the protocol. And it's really about giving the staff within these facilities advice and um, assistance about how to kind of try and identify if one of their customers come in, maybe have withdrawn large sums of money and potentially the victim of a scam. So it's about kind of giving them the tools and the knowledge about how to kind of question people, you know, and just make sure that they've withdrawn that large sum of money for something that's legitimate. Um, so the, the idea will be that we'll visit jointly with trading standards, provide um, the staff within sort of advice and guidance and sort of leaflets and signage. And as well as that, we've kind of got some really kind of bogus crane leaflets and no call calling signs, stickers that we're kind of hoping to get distributed as well. So um, that's kind of planned for the start of December. Um, and the last thing really from me is we're in very early discussions with Cumbernauld Theatre just to discuss and identify some um, alternative diversionary tactics for youths within the area. So that's kind of early work and kind of conversations that we're having. Um, but happy to hear any questions, if there is any. Thanks very much, Susan, and welcome to the, the town board. Uh, Councillor Goldie and Councillor Barclay. Hi, Susan, it was nice to meet you. Uh, and I hope that you're getting some of your team back from COP26 and you're starting to kind of get a grip on things there. Uh, it's just a comment, really, and it's just to see if you were aware of uh, Sandy Nows and Walbury area in Carbrain. Um, I've had taken this up with Rhodes, and Rhodes essentially have said it's a police matter rather than theirs. We're getting people actually driving on the pavements inside the, the state. And it's just to see if your community team have noticed that or if they haven't to if I could maybe bring it to their attention. There's certainly a couple of elderly uh, people down there being concerned that when I've stepped out the front door there's been a car driving along the enclosed pavement. There is a bollard there, but the bollard doesn't stop a vehicle going through if they drive through the grass area. And I have requested that roads and transportation put additional bollards in without success. So it's just really to make your team aware of it and see if they can have a wee look at it and see whether it is as frequent as I think it might be. <laughs> no, thank you for that, Councillor. I have very recently been um, cited on that by Councillor Green. He kind of raised the same concerns. Um, and it is something that now that my team are back from COP26, um, I'll pass to the local ward officer there just to sort of monitor that, give that a bit of extra attention. But what I would ask is if uh, you could pass on to constituents, if they can call the police when the problems are sort of arising. And we will certainly try and do our very best to sort of get down um, in a timely fashion. Um, but we will do a bit of kind of follow up with the council because I think that, um, you know, about the kind of some conversations to see if there's any, as you see, additional bollards or maybe needed, and that might kind of resolve the problem. But we will certainly kind of go down and pay a bit of extra attention. Thank you, Councillor Barclay. Okay, thanks, Chair. Hi, Susan. It's nice to see you. Um, uh, you were talking about uh, the parcel theft. I mean, I don't know if you're aware of there's there's been huge issues with Hermes parcels. Um, a, a lot to do with problems at their, their main sorting offices because they they didn't have lorry drivers to deliver between their different sections and then they didn't have enough drivers to do the actual deliveries. Uh, there was a, a, an instance where um, a whole load of parcels were dumped in Eben Hill. I think the, the, the impression that was given was I think the delivery driver had had enough and he just he, he quit 
an empty diabetes boot or whatever of all the parcels in the middle of the road and just left. Um, they then, people were down looking at them and finding their own parcels and then all the parcels disappeared. So don't know whether or not um, somebody came from Hermes and retrieved them or whether somebody thought this would be a really good bunch for to look for for Christmas presents, just to kind of um, be aware there seems to be a, a big issue where Hermes are concerned. There's issues with them all, but just now seems to be, and usually um, kind of locally, you know, people will know who the delivery people are, but because they've been so swamped with um, coming up to Christmas, I think, there's been a lot of uh, new people that have got involved and maybe just not been aware of the amount of work it entails. There's just, there have been issues to let you know of that one. Um, just kind of, if to see if you've caught, uh, it's not putting you on the spot, but kind of any any comment and everything that happened on a uh, Guy Fox night, um, we, you know, it was, a, it could not have been written. It was, if you want to talk about the perfect storm, the fact was it's, it's firework night, there's a gas leak, the, you've lost a lot of your officers to COP26 and we have people who have no sense of danger. Um, so it, it was best to see kind of a few, the, the, the police that were, did, were doing the best they could. I mean, they were, the, they were trying to protect um, the, the fire service who were going through a, a, a really torrid time, um, but they were also trying to stop people set off fire works within the exclusion zone. But if you get any any kind of thoughts about the communication um, with SGN or, or anything that you can kind of share with us, to say that it's a, a, a kind of a learning curve, I don't really think we would come across anything like that ever again. But it kind of opens up uh, questions about kind of SGN doing their best but communication. But the girl that I spoke to was great, but she, she didn't really know the area. She didn't. The, so there was there was fall downs that way, just if you've got any kind of comment on that one, Susan. No, thank you very much. Just in relation to parcels, um, um, I, yeah, we are kind of aware of some of the issues, you know, or the concerns around about Hermes. Um, what I have done is we have a national safety communities team um, with kind of cadre of officers brief with Gap Posh, and I've asked them to sort of try and do a wee bit of work with some of the courier companies, including Hermes. Um, just to see if there is any kind of other alternative methods that they can use rather than just leaving the parcel on the doorstep as we are sort of seeing this rise. So that is kind of work that's going to go in the background just in relation to that. Um, just in relation to the bonfire night, um, certainly in relation to the sort of communication that was circulated, I also kind of shared it with the sheriff and the other kind of councillors from the group from what we sort of got from the facilities company. Um, I, Obviously, there's still a kind of live inquiries. I'm very limited to what I can say, but obviously, we all have seen it in the kind of media. I know that there was a piece running that in the local newspapers that there was um, incidents involving the fire officers. There is inquiry ongoing to try and identify uh, the youth and the persons involved in that. The difficulty with it is it was obviously very dark, um, they were all dressed in dark clothing, hoods up, etc. Um, so the kind of CCTV review hasn't yielded a huge amount of um, information for us, unfortunately. So I would certainly encourage if there's any kind of knowledge in the local area of people who were responsible, please encourage that to be fed through to the police. It will give us a kind of line of inquiry, whether that's anonymous reporting through crime stoppers um, or through the kind of local ward officer or whatever. Um, we would certainly kind of welcome that information to try and help and support that inquiry. Um, yeah, it was, as you say, just I, I don't think, and I hope that we don't actually see it again, the timing couldn't have been any worse um, for that sort of, you know, the kind of bonfire events, etc. And there, there will, unfortunately, kind of always be those people that, that don't necessarily follow the rules and guidance. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I'm aware that Billy's indicated that he's got a couple of AOCB items. I'm very conscious of the time, so... If we're all okay to move on, I'll move on to AOCB. Billy, you had a question. Aye, it's okay. I can bring it up in any other business. Right, go for it, Billy. Right. It was just, um, or you, you want to get, what is it you okay, want to do? We've gone on to AOCB, so if you right. want to bring that up then. Right. Um, as I say, I apologise for not getting out to everybody, you know. And there's quite a few items, you know, that I've came to head with me with phone calls and messages that I've received. Um, 
the first one is my boss to see if the you know we're elected members of the a lots of complaints about my boss. Um, there was a pensioners group I was with today, and they actually couldn't get the my boss at all to take them to the group. Um, they actually had to get other transport to the group. Um, it seems to be to that there's only one bus, and it's a trottle bus, they call it. And it's actually um, between Cumbernauld, Airdrie and Coke Bridge, it's working the three areas. Now, this is a ridiculous situation for the amount of elderly that we've got in Cumbernauld, and they can't get a my bus, you know, when they phone up. So I think it's something that needs to be looked into. And I think it needs to be looked into ASAP. Um, the other thing is um, they I got a phone call about um, the St Enoch's clock and also, you know, got a message. Um, and it was from the St Enoch Centre, um, which has all been renovated in Glasgow. And they were asking if it would be possible um, to maybe get to the community and donate the clock maybe back to Glasgow, which they will put in a prominent place in the new St. Enoch Centre. So it's just food for thought and see how people, you know, come to terms with that, you know, because it's sitting, as you know, Suzanne, up in a wee corner in the town centre. Nobody sees it because there's not the availability of getting up to it, especially for disabled and elderly. So it's just something to take up. Um, the other thing was um, I found out about if you want to um, lease a shop in the old part of the town centre at the moment, they're only giving out two to three year leases. Um, I'd just like to, um, you know, know a bit more of that and see maybe planning can maybe let us know more about why this is happening. Are they going to demolish it sooner than what, what we think? You know, so it's just something I'd love to hear about. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is thank Cornerstone. As you know, the link was closed to all community groups and taking over for the vaccine and Cornerstone, I must say, stepped in and accommodated the biggest part of our groups. That was from, you know, the smallest groups to the larger groups. So I'd like to thank Cornerstone for that. Um, the other thing um, that I'd like to mention, I was going to bring in uh, the police um, there. Um, we're going to start um, the crime prevention panel are going to start the bike marking again. It came to a halt through the COP26, you know, because all police were, you know, involved in that. So we will be starting the bike marking event again, and that will go into all primary schools in Cumbernauld, and then we'll go to the Northern Corridor and Colesife. So we're going to every primary school and going to do the bike marking. It's been a great success, Suzanne, so we wish to carry it on. And as you know, we managed to get funding for it. So we will be continuing with that. That's Thanks, great. Suzanne. Thank you very much. That's fashion, Billy. Thank you. And I think we'll know all your points. Um, and then I've got um, Adam wants to come in. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, just on, on Billy's points here. So as I understand it, the, the council's intention is to have the new town centre done and dusted within 10 years. So it may be that they would be looking to start something in the next few years, but I think it would be useful if we could get Craig McIntyre to the next meeting to give us an update on where we yeah. are with the, the town centre. Um, uh, development and as well in this in, in a clock as well you know I would hope and expect that the clock would be part of the the redeveloped Cumbernauld Town Centre going forward but perhaps an update from Craig would be really useful for the next meeting um, and the only other point I wanted to, to mention as well is Claire had mentioned about the, the gas leak 
Um, and uh, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to um, my issues around consultation and engagement from a community perspective. The, the communication on that was really poor and sometimes non-existent. Um, and it doesn't uh, give me any confidence in, a, you know, in an emergency situation that we would have good levels of consultation engagement. Um, and it's whether or not the council and other uh, partners and stakeholders, you know, police, fire, NHS, utility companies do or should have a register of stakeholders who they can alert in, in times of an emergency. Again, I think that would be useful if, if it doesn't exist. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think there was, an, there was a, an emergency planning point that was raised by Lisa and that's been dealt with off table. So maybe that's something, Gary, that I could be picked up at that point in time as well. Okay, Councillor Goldie, and then I think that's everyone. Yeah. Just uh, on the point of the St. Ears clock, I think there's a, a fair amount, as Adam was saying, that people think it should be displayed in a more prominent position in Cumbernauld, because essentially it was gifted to the people of Cumbernauld and they feel that to hand it back to Glasgow would be going against the wishes of the, the people that had it. But there are complications with the clock now, because I think there's actually a dispute to see who actually owns it, because I think... Yeah. Uh, one of the companies that thinks it own it, owns it perhaps doesn't, but I think that's a, 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 a strange situation to be in. Uh, just on the, the town centre thing, you may find it difficult to get much of an update on it because I think a lot of the, I think the council described this, the situation just now as sensitive. Uh, and I think it's going to be difficult to find out what's happening because I think there's certain financial things going on and companies involved in it and I think that uh, you may not get an awful lot of information about the town centre at this present moment. Not because they, they don't want to tell you but I think there are certain commercial sensitivities just now. So on, on both counts Billy, I don't know and I don't know. <laughs> just on, on the thing about the my bus is that run by SPT? Do you know who runs it? Sorry, Billy. Sorry, Chair. I wonder if we could maybe take that one off the table. Aye, do that. Maybe, maybe you, you and Billy could have a bit of a discussion Aye. about that, because it does sound as if it needs a bit further, further discussion, Aye. which if, is more Billy than we can talk about. Billy can send an email or something. I can get in touch with SPT and ask That'd them the situation. Yep. Is. That'd be great, Robert. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Susanna, can I come in just for a couple of points, please? Uh huh. Um, just because um, it's in the Cumberland News, um, I've been working closely with um, Billy and uh, the Community Forum and the uh, oh, Cumberland action. Poverty Action. Um, we were approached by the Scottish Government to continue some of the work that we've done during COVID um, and it's um, Community Recovery Fund Mark 2. Um, I don't know who was funded in part one, but we were certainly funded and we were we were giving out some grants then. It's called the Given Project. So they've extended that again um, and we are in the middle of just finalising a community survey based on the uh, impact of COVID on community groups, individuals and community and around uh, the impact of changes to people's income. That's where the community um, poverty action, uh, Cumberland poverty action comes in. So there's a bit in the Cumberland News, my lead officer that's uh, dealing with the developing the survey and that's his specialism doing surveys and also um marketing uh as uh has got that in the paper uh, for this week the service will be going out probably next week we've got quite a tight turnaround it's funded up to march but it will give us a strategic overview of i'm talking about groups that engage with us 
as an anchor organisation and also around some of the groups that, that have had grants via different strands of funding that we were managing during COVID. Um, uh, I'm meeting with Billy tomorrow and the Vice Chair of the Community Forum just to thrash out a couple of uh, details. But Billy will be streaming that through his uh, members um, specifically to target people that haven't got um, a digital um, access. Um, and a lot of the groups that maybe Billy deals with, he was explaining there some of the the pensioners um, around that. So, and, and also on top of that, in January, we're releasing another twenty thousand pound of grants. It's not a lot of money, but it's a lot to manage when it's targeting smaller groups. And um, we will, I will get all the. I'll make sure that the survey uh, is. Um, information is passed on to you all if you want to engage in it. That's smashing, Mary. Thanks very much. And the other thing is um, the council approached us to try and help the groups at the link. To be quite honest with you, one day they were told we're going to um, activate your booking again. And then the next day they were told, no, no, you can't activate your booking because it's going to be a vaccination centre. So there was a bit of a um, joint bit of working done with myself and um, Lorna, Billy's laughing. He was supervising us, weren't you, Billy? Yes. <laughs> and um, we did manage to accommodate most of the groups that wanted to come over to Cornerstone. And because Cornerstone's so big and we're really busy, we've got 5,000 of a football every month coming into the building, possibly more now. Um, the... Uh, um, most of the groups we could accommodate because they were walking in in different days, different times, and some. And we're open from nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night, Monday to Thursday, and nine till four Friday, Saturday. Um, thank you. It's so great much. to see groups working together like that. So thanks very much, Mary. That's no, great. no, no bother. I just wanted everybody to know. Thank you. Uh, you know, we're trying to solve a problem, find a solution. Give Great. me a solution. Give me a solution. It's not a problem. That's smashing. Thanks very much. Okay, on that note, I think we'll bring the meeting to a close. We've gone over quite a bit of time, and I, I apologise to the officers who have been at their desks since early doors this morning. So apologies for going over. Can I just remind groups if you have any items to bring to the chain board, if you make sure that you put them in as part of the um, agenda when you're called for agenda items. Mm -hmm. It just means that we can manage the agenda and manage the time a bit better. Um, and I would finish up by saying to Alex, um, congratulations on taking on the chairmanship and wishing you all the very best and thanking everyone for the participation tonight. Thank you, Thanks, so thank you. Thanks well, thank to our excellent chair. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Suzanne, you've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Good night, everybody.